to introduce our speaker for the session, architect Arun Jain, urban designer, urban strategist, chief urban designer and principal planner, city of Bellevue, Washington, USA. Arun Jain is a US and Indian educated urban designer and urban strategist with over 35 years of US and international experience in practice and academia. He has planned, designed and directly influenced over 90 new private and public projects across the world with combined investment capital of over US dollar 14 billion. He has spoken in over 100 major keynotes, conferences, seminars and workshops. Arun has taught at six universities with contributions in both print and digital media. His work involvements span 43 countries and over 110 cities. His many notable roles including guest professor, technical university of Berlin, strategic planning advisor to the Indian state of Karnataka population 64 million and Portland, Oregon's first chief urban designer. He has been a United Nations lead expert on SDG 11, a policy advisor to UN Habitat 3 and a contributor to UNODC on urban safety and security. Arun's long-standing interests revolve around strategies to deal with complex and uncertain futures and creating better decision support tools to support them. He sees the early creation of soft infrastructure, including public realm, as an essential basis for resilient communities. Arun is a fellow of American Institute of Certified Planners. Let us now proceed to architect Arun's presentation. Hello, Anoop, and thank you, and good morning, everyone. I'm assuming you can hear me. Um, a special thanks to Anoop and SRM for inviting me to speak with all of you. Uh, I've known Anoop for a while, and so it's a particular thrill always when uh, you're invited out of the blue, like uh, Anoop just called me up. I'm going to share with you um, a very integrated perspective of science, uh, sciences, it's sociology, culture, and technology. And in my mind, all these things, or all these aspects, contribute to urban development, which in turn sort of lends itself to quality of life. And I'm sure that each of you, regardless of your particular professional um, bias and interest, uh, are concerned about one form or another quality of life and urban development and how these two connect with each other. I'm going to talk about uh, all of these things in about six different little short um, portions. The first one is the challenges and dilemmas that we face as uh, people who are trying to improve quality of life and the urban environment. The second is trajectory, which where are we going uh, as, as a society, as people, as a planet? What are the different forces at play which are competing with each other? What is the role of technology in all of this? What are the positive disruptive forces? And I'll end with what are the positive disruptive approaches that we might be taking. So let's get started. Um, some slides I'll go through very quickly and others I'll spend a little bit more time on. So this is a science fiction writer that I like a lot, William Gibson. And he, I think, rightly points out that the future is here, but it's just not very evenly distributed. Um, so we don't have to think, look too far to look at the possibilities of what's possible. I want to start with four ideas. The world is increasingly complex and uncertain, and we need better ways to cope with it. I'm actually writing a book on the topic. Uh, we need to embrace positive disruptive forces at play, and you'll see this towards the end of the presentation. We need better links between theory and practice, and I'll expand on that as well. And then the last one here is that we need to collectively learn and dramatically adapt to the challenges of uncertain futures. And since we're all dealing with the COVID virus, I'm sure that front and center in everyone's mind is that all the things that we assumed until now, how do they apply and will they apply? And will the old sort of habits and practices and best practices and norms and theories, how much of that is relevant? At the same time, there are a number of complex forces at play. So there's inconsistencies between what citizens need and what they expect. 
a need is not a want. There's inconsistencies between what societies can or try to do, uh, even between the, in, within those kinds of discussions. And for that matter, it's the same with technology. What is technology able to do and what does it want to do? And how does any of that have to do with urban development? Where is it helping and where is it not? And then it's a struggle to future-proof anything that we build if we actually don't really, if we're not really very sure about the future that we're planning for. And so to bridge these divides, we need to understand the dominant drivers. And these drivers are governance systems, human behavior and nature, institutional habit and tradition, culture and personalities, and then finally, how we invest and how we finance all the things that we want. These are not easy territories. You know, we all know that sometimes people say government, government is the problem, but often government has a role to play that no one else can. And so the question is, how do we respond, shape, influence, and all of those particular aspects? You know, how do we deal with the structural problems? We might know what to do, but then decision makers and influencers or the elected are not really capable of, the structure is not set up for them to basically respond to experts. Uh, we have a shifting paradigm. So we can't assume, if we're looking into the future, that growth will always happen or that the kind of growth we're imagining will always happen. We have ongoing global turmoil. So in a, in, we're all looking now and talking a lot more about social injustice and inequities. We have increasing struggles over declining uh, resources as we get more and more middle class uh, out there. And that I would say that COVID is actually an opportunity for radical positive change. Because a lot of the problems that we are finding in the US, but not just in the US, everywhere else in the world, problems that existed before, COVID has just simply amplified them and made them very, very up uh, in front of us and very stark. So there's some rhetorical questions here now. So the rhetorical question is, if we plan it, will it happen? And if we build it, will people come? And the answer to both of those questions is not sure, yes, it's actually maybe and sometimes. Just because we plan something doesn't mean it'll happen. Just because we build a stadium doesn't mean people will come, right? So, so we have to be very careful about sort of what, what we're doing and the, what the underlying sort of realities are going to be. And then, of course, the question is, can we implement everything we want? And the answer usually is no. And then the question is, okay, if you could, if you said you want to do that much and you can only do that much, how do you prioritize it? How do you put, say, with the resources I have, what is the most urgent and important thing I ought to do? So I'll launch in the first of those six things I was talking about. I'm not going to read all this stuff to you. Um, those of you that are students of uh, urban uh, history and uh, sociology will know the name Lewis Mumford. In 1922, he wrote a book about sort of saying, you know, if you look at that middle quote there, it says, the quest in the quest for financial and political power, the notion of limits have disappeared. There are no limits on numbers, no limits on wealth, there's no limits on population growth, there's no limits on urban expansion. And quite to the contrary, quantitative expansion has become the predominant issue. So the question is, we are both alienating entire groups of people because they can't afford things, but we're also quantifying everything. Instead of dwelling about quality of life, we're quantifying it and saying, how much resources do you have compared to the next guy? Okay, so similarly, another intellectual hero of mine, John Friedman, um, in his book, That Good Society, talks about the fact that the more we try to control people by putting one regulation on top of another regulation, we are actually destroying the whole notion of human individuality. 
Um, and that basically, uh, that's the main point there. Jane Jacobs, who um, many of you might have read, she's talked about a lot of things, but I think the one that's relevant here is we tend to mistake cities as problems of simplicity and disorganized complexity when in fact they're exactly the opposite. They are, cities are problems of organized complexity, and I'll talk about complexity in a little bit. This is an old professor of mine, Russ Akoff, and he says, this is, a very, this is worth reading, he says, desire and improvement cannot be imposed on one by another. To try and do so is cruel as well as futile. Development cannot take place until its time has come and when it is wanted, and so it should always be left as a matter of free choice. Now, that's true. You know, as planners, we are constantly, or designers, we are constantly trying to say, I know what you want, but what if our stakeholders say, no, that's actually not true. We don't want it right now, maybe in the future. But the interesting thing about Russ is that he ends up saying, trying is an idea that's whose time has also come. So that means we have to keep trying because we never know what is the right time. So we have to keep taking uh, sensitive ideas that are sensible, equitable, you know, um, trying to improve our quality of life as our total group, uh, all of us, um, and say we have to keep trying because we never know when it will suddenly resonate and take off. Okay, so where are we going? So if we look at trajectory, let's just look at some basic numbers in terms of the skew of a distribution of urbanization. So everyone knows that the world is 51% urbanized, right? But this percentage distribution is not equal. So this is where the urbanization currently is. So 82% in the U.S. is urbanized. South, uh, South America is 80% urbanized. Europe is 73% urbanized, right? And look at that. Uh, Africa and Asia are 48% and 40% respectively uh, of urbanized. And despite that, Asia contains 53% of the world's urbani urbanized population. So what I'm trying to convey to you guys is that 70% of future urbanization is going to all occur in Asia and Africa, and it's going to happen very fast. So in India, the urban population today is roughly 377 million. And by 2030, which is really 10 years from now, it's the estimate is somewhere between 5 and 800 million people will live in urban centers, right? In China, the country is 56% urbanized and they have an urbanized rate of 2.5%. And Nigeria is going to add another 212 million. And so by 2050, India, China, and Nigeria will account for 37% of all the total urban population in the world. Those are scary numbers. And that changes the entire sort of perspective by which we have to look and say, how do we manage growth in urban centers? Some cities are going to remain in crisis. And yes, we should try and uh, sort of fix them. But how do we manage the problem? So we have to both sort of look to the future for solutions. But even in the meantime, while we're trying to figure out what to do at that scale of change, we also have to figure out ways to soften the blow, make it as as less horrible as possible for the most number of people. And I'll come back to that idea again. There are not many cities who are designed to handle disasters. So you, you can see in the various pictures here, there's, you know, the food lines in India for people waiting to get fed for migrant workers. There's Somali flood refugees. Even in the U.S., there's Hurricane Sandy. You can see the mess there. And even in the West Bank, you know, or places like that. So what I'm trying to say is that heavy settlement and development pressures and a false sense of security are going to only increase suffering. The question I want you to all take away, and when you think about this, is does economic growth equal social gain? 
And we keep assuming that economic growth is an essential part of an improved quality of life. And I tend to disagree with that. I tend to think it's, an, it's a component, but it shouldn't be the driver. Quality of life has to do with many other things. Uh, you can live in a relatively modest house and still have a high quality of life. I think all of you, when you think about Vedic principles, when you think of basic other um, uh, you know, elements of Indian heritage, uh, you should uh, probably embrace that and know that, of course, it's possible. The social metrics and goals that we use should lead and become a basis for economic development, at least in planning. So it's not eco eco economics, it's social metrics and goals of social objectives. These are two kids, basically, you know, this is a makeshift school under a metro bridge in Delhi. So the point is that you've heard heard me heard it referred to is that I'm a great fan of saying before you do physical infrastructure, we should be creating the soft social infrastructure. And these spaces and places, unfortunately, they only happen when development that has been focused on jobs and sometimes on housing is already in place. And I'm saying we should turn it upside down. So the question is, where could we be going? And I will posit four different sort of development trajectories of where we could be going. And one of them is, okay, uh, growth, where we are growing, but we are just one step ahead of disaster. The second is constraint, which is much more optimistic or much more uh, positive, let's say. Um, where we have sustainable growth or paths in a low capital world. That is unlikely, but nevertheless, it's possible. The third is collapse, where we have lots of local disasters and we have regional conflicts. And the fourth is transformation, which is superstructured system. The reality is that we're oscillating between option one and three. I think each of you will recognize either looking locally or looking at regionally or nationally or internationally, we are just, it seems like we're just one step ahead of disaster. And there's lots of local disasters popping up all the time. And certainly there's lots of regional conflicts. So number three, we get into what are the realities and the forces at play? So look at this. This is inequity. This is Mumbai. This is preparing for the monsoon. Look at the size of the houses and the footprints of these towers compared to the informal settlements. Look at the density shift. So that versus that, right? And then you look at another place in the world. This is Johannesburg, where I was two years ago. And you look at single family, attached, nice, middle class, fancy homes compared to that right next door, right? And then look at this. This is in also Cape Town in South Africa. This is a South African guy who takes a drone and takes, uh, puts the drone up and takes these pictures. And they are, they are just really, they amplify the fact that we ought to be ashamed of ourselves, that we are just basically living like this right next to that, right? And by the way, the US is not afraid, not far away from this. Another shot of, from that. But this is, this is Seattle. And you can see a fancy new apartment or condo building being developed right next to these blue tarpaulins, which are homeless people. And so, yes, we don't have it at the scale at which we see it in developing countries, but it exists and it's shameful. It's absolutely shameful. They are hidden from the street because there's a fence here. But the moment they found this empty lot, they took it over. It gets even worse in Silicon Valley. So if you go down to San Francisco, all of these, uh, what do you call RVs? These are motor homes. These are people who are migrant workers who are working in the shops on the ground floor here. And they're living in these with their families because it's cheaper to live like this than to drive for two hours and still have rents which are too expensive. There's another kind of inequity about the in inequity about distribution of wealth. So when the, the cathedral at Notre Dame in uh, Paris burned down, within a month, 
there was $835 million pledged to fix it. It's 674 years old. Look at the one next to it. 7,000 square miles of Amazon forest, critical for our planet, 55 million year old forest. The, the G7 basically contributed only 20 million. And so you have to ask yourself, what is the, what is the common sense in that? I want to introduce two more ideas which I think are very important. Um, and one is, this one has to do with the idea of uncertainty. And just think about it this way. The quality of your life is in direct proportion to the amount of uncertainty you can comfortably deal with. So as an example, look at this little video where there's a bird who's gone into a grocery store and is stealing potato chips. Now, that's uncertainty. How on earth could you plan for that kind of thing or avoid it, right? That's kind of the funny part of it. But complexity, when we look at it, is life is made up of collections of organized complexity, right? Our physical world is incomplete, open-ended systems. Our key to working with complexity, at least from my point of view, and I welcome you to argue with it, is not trying to overcome simplicity, but to embrace it. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. There's a cultural anthropologist by the name of Joseph Tainter, who I like very much because he writes about why complex systems and societies fail. Um, because he, he'll make, he makes these assertions that human societies are problem-solving organizations. The socio-political systems require energy for their maintenance. There's increased complexity carries increased cost per capita, and investment in social political complexity as a problem solving response often reaches a point of diminishing returns. So let me explain it in terms of this graph. So you'll see here that, um, oops. So if you plotted complexity and time against each other, then you could see you could draw a bell curve, and this bell curve would say, in the early stages, as complexity is growing in any system, there's a positive return on those complex on that complexity. But there's a point at which it uh, become more negative marginal returns. There's a second curve underneath it, the yellow one that you see, that is, as systems become more complex, the systems required to manage them also need to become more complex. The problem is they can't keep up. So by the time you hit uh, the peak, the inflection point, you can see there that there's the, the gap between the complexity of the system and the ability to manage it is at its maximum, right? Now the decline could basically take, a, it could be a precipitous decline or it could be a slow decline, it doesn't matter. The problem is, where are we? And I would argue that when you look at, and it's a deeper conversation we don't have time for, you can engage me individually. But the point is, we're somewhere out there in that purple circle um, that basically says we're either still got a little bit more positive to go or we're already in the negative zone in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. Okay, so what this means is that we need to take into account vulnerability. When I was in Berlin, I taught a course on how cities can handle shocks to their system. We looked at Bhopal, we looked at Fukushima, we looked at Sandy, we looked at earthquakes, we looked at old fires of Great Fire of London. The point is that we are more resilient against uncertainty and shocks when the social inequities in a culture are not so big. When the hard and soft infrastructure is good and mutually reinforcing. When the complex systems, meaning societies in this case, have adaptive and long-term approaches to development. And these goals are limited by all the things I talked about before, which is inflexible governance, institutional history, inherited social tensions, territoriality, and economic uncertainties. And these disasters, whether they are natural or man-made, tend to amplify the most vulnerable groups, the suffering of the most vulnerable. I'm not going to get very much into this slide. 
I just want to make a big point again. We can go back to it in there. You can see the heading. It says theory is not practice. Now, having taught in so many universities and having worked around the world and done so many real projects, I can tell you for sure that one of the biggest mistakes is when you have some theoretical guy stand up and say, I know what you should do. Theory without practice doesn't make sense. Practice without theory doesn't make sense. And there's very few people who focus on integrating both of them. So the sum of this is you look at this particular uh, sort of element where you say, look at advocacy planning, participatory planning, and simulation models. Those are the three legs of the stool that I consider drive most of current and applied planning. There is a disconnect between those kinds of ways of interacting and deciding how, what should we do on the ground with all the theories that are floating around. And I'll leave it at that because we actually don't have enough time. So the next part is how can tech help? So everybody is obsessed about technology. I'm fine with technology. I don't have a problem with it. But think about it this way. A wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. The more data you have, the less space you have to look around. You do not know where to look and what data to understand and how much of it is relevant and how much of this it is superfluous. The second thing I would say is that there are no morals about technology. Moral technology is like a hammer. If you, if you have a hammer, some, all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. You want to use it everywhere. On the other hand, you know, it's just a tool. So you can use the hammer for something good, or you can use it to kill someone. And it's, it's, not, it's, it's not the hammer's fault. It's how we use it. Okay. Technology is disruptive. We know this, but I'm talking about it in the urban sense, in the urban development sense. So um, how much time do we have? About 10 minutes, I think. Um, so I'll put it to you this way. When I moved to Berlin, there were 11,500 Airbnb listings just in Berlin, more than all the major cities in Germany combined, which equaled 35,000 beds. When you take 35,000 beds out of the long-range rental market and you put them into the short-term rental market, you have radically altered the rental market. And as a consequence in Berlin, it was almost impossible for a normal person to find a place to rent until they changed the regulation and said, Airbnb cannot function like that. You have to lend, uh, leave, uh, give out your house for at least a month. And of course, that changed the entire landscape. So the point is cities struggle to keep up with the market and rapid change as far as technology goes. It's hard to imagine uncertain futures because we are so uncertain about them. And it's easier for cities to leave innovation to the market and say that's not the role of government. On the other hand, if government, if we don't create mechanisms to manage technology, we get some pretty weird looking skews. So I'll quickly talk about Rio de Janeiro. IBM put about $10 million and created this giant control center where they were managing and monitoring all the infrastructure in the city from traffic to utilities to electricity to information flows and whatever. And then it was very interesting because the lower one, so, so they had two. They had one civilian and then the military said, oh, we want one too because we have to monitor social unrest and all those kinds of things. And it was kind of, the point is, nobody's really using them very much anymore, even though a lot of money was spent on them. So again, I'm going to run through these and we can revisit them if you have them in the Q&A and want me to revisit them. But here's what technology offers us, better access. But then the flip side of that, the counterbalance is selective access. Can you afford what is being offered? The second part is um, better choices. But then sometimes you get information overload. You say, I can't make a decision. There are too many choices. Customization compared to obsolescence. Things actually, uh, you know, you can customize, you get more specialized services. But now suddenly you've got more waste production. You've got more um, 
jobs being lost or we've placed you've got enhanced experience but then are you losing your privacy you've got comfort efficiency and safety but are you suddenly now exposed to uncertainty and risk are you saying i understand the situation better but what opportunities am i missing am i doing more with less or am i consuming more and then the last one in this sequence is let's look at reliability versus dependence if i wanted to put this in a large graphic here's how i see the world right now you look at contentment equity capital flows complexity hyper change resources political will technology is pushing all of them and what's following the built infrastructure economies people and communities learning management and organization leadership and the policy and the last thing is the natural environment technology is screaming at us and saying boy do i have a solution for you this is what really should happen we should put learning first the natural environment and leadership we should put these in some reasonable hierarchy and tell technology help us with this from the back from the behind don't lead from the front we should be telling all these different things bubbles that you see in front should be in fact um driving what technology should do we should say do that now i also want to talk about information and data because we're all obsessed with that these days even as planners and put it to you in this pyramid here and say there's three things as data there's information and there's knowledge right and these get shrinking and knowledge itself is broken up into understanding and wisdom now i would argue with you that most of us are going back and forth between information and data and the fact that it takes we have too much emphasis on it and i think we all know that wisdom requires time and experience and we are just too fast tracking everything to basically even pay attention to that we have no time left simulations are not predictions uh let me see how much time do we have yeah we can, i can talk about this a little bit so this is a real example when i was the chief urban designer in portland the metro area the regional planning authority ran a simulation model on population projection and said by 2060 the population would double from 1 million to 2 million small by indian standards but nevertheless doubling the population everyone went crazy the the planning director went to the mayor and said the hordes are coming the hordes are coming we need to double our infrastructure we need to create new neighborhoods we need to do all that stuff all the neighborhoods started politically mobilizing and saying oh these hordes are coming the hordes are coming we um have to politically mobilize against our single family homes now becoming apartment buildings 3 months later the state unemployment office ran its own population projection and basically ended up saying that the projection was lower for the entire state than metro was talking about just the metro area so i asked the question rather impolite question which number were we going to plan for 3 months of silence from the mayor's office and then they said we'll plan for the metro number because it's more optimistic okay what a stupid idea Three months after that, the global economy crashed. Today, no one talks about one million people. When you look at these curves, these curves, you say, well, let's let's assume that the projection model was okay. It doesn't tell you where the growth will happen. Will it happen in the middle, in the beginning, or at the end? Will it be bumpy or a smooth hockey stick? What does it? When does it do? And it matters because you've got to set that infrastructure, and then you've got to pay for it. Um, the fact of the matter is. the 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 lesson to be learned from this is that the problem is not with the model the problem is not with the software the problem is not with the software designer the problem is with the uneducated out consumer of the output of the model because if you go to any one of these modelers they will be the first ones to tell you that this is how far the model can go and these are the underlying assumptions and the model is only as good as the assumptions right so we have to ask ourselves all the time what conditions are we planning for 
This one I won't spend a lot of time on, except to say if you looked at all of these elements about what we need in cities, these are all qualitative. But technology is not able to address them directly. Technology helps us with comprehension, with diagnostics, with decision support, with deployment, with management and maintenance and monitoring. Now, what's needed is an opportunity for technology. When technology can address those issues, it provides value. Now, the intersect between them is not huge. And all of this is being governed by human behavior. And that's the innovation space. So that little triangle you see in the middle, that's the limited framework in which innovation has meaning. So the question is, can tech help the majority? There are more than 50% of the world's urban developer, dwellers are poor, and informal settlements are very hard and very expensive to fix. Um, and so I would argue to you that tech needs to be able to help develop entities and work at low and very low margins. It should not be focused on all the high-tech stuff that only rich people can afford. Now, again, I'm going to just use this to illustrate a couple of crazy points. When I, In 2016, when I was in Venice at the Venice Biennale, I came across an exhibit that had 100 cities that were new cities that were all tech-oriented. Sorry, I jumped a bit. And you can see here that in Tianjin, in China, they wanted to copy Manhattan. And this is what they came up with. And this is what it looks like. Empty streets. Nobody knows what to do with that crazy stuff. Right? Look at this. In South Sudan, somebody said, let's design a city in the shape of a rhino. These people are crazy. Now the question is, who would do this? Probably some politician, right? Or you look at Amravati, or you look at other designs, and you say, why are they showing me designs for 20% of the population? What about the remaining 80%? And how are they going to live? And what are you doing to improve their quality of life? How are these neighborhoods going to be sustainable, easy access, green, healthy, safe, all those things, right? So I think it's, it's an interesting question. So we're almost towards the end. So here's a list of all the posit positive disruptive forces. So cities have a lot of untapped potential. They are giant vacuum cleaners of resources, wood, steel, timber, coal, asphalt, everything you can imagine. And we don't recover any of that. But so it's a kind of a one way street. We'll, mine the world, we'll empty the world, and then we'll build and build and build. And what do we do with everything that we don't need? We just throw it away. So it's just very difficult difficult to sort of structure that. So I'm going to throw a couple of very quick slides in front of you and say um, social entrepreneurship. So everyone knows the Grameen Bank that started in Bangladesh. Grameen America, if you can believe it or not, does micro loans to American small women run small businesses and you can see the dollar amount there they have contributed the bank has lent already grameen america has lent 761 million three quarters of a billion dollars just to small women businesses so it works it works in every place right so social entrepreneurship and social impact investing it started off rather small in the first generation and now the big banks are going after it, like Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan are doing $500 billion worth of social entrepreneur impact investing, where the money goes exclusively to small businesses and small localized community-based enterprises. Participatory budgeting, this kind of speaks for itself where citizens start making their own budgets um, and those kinds of things. Um, look at sharing economies. Now, this is like you don't need to buy your tools. Every house doesn't need to buy the same equipment. You have like a library of tools and you can go borrow them and then return them. And what that does is other things. It creates digital literacy, job creation, skill development, and convenience. And the question is, these are, these are ways to reduce expenses and doing that. 
We have crowdsourced policy making. This is what gives politicians uh, heart attacks because basically now people are deciding um, what the policies ought to be in a group, right? Okay, we're almost at the end here. So these are the, sorry, you should say six. These are the positive disruptive forces. You can take schools and you can explode the school into the surrounding neighborhoods. You can take the medical clinic, the library, the workshops, and make them available to the community around you. You can take academic programs and you can say, if I want to have lifelong learning, why do I need a degree? But can I sort of structure the academic programs in a way that somebody can enter and exit at any point in their life without a degree and then contribute directly to institutions, industry, or the public sector? Right? I'm trying to go fast now. We can embrace complexity. We can look at watersheds. But just like we look at watersheds, we can look at energy sheds. And we can look at waste management sheds. And we can look at habitation, natural habitation sheds and look at the intersects between them and say, how do they all come together in different settings? And then we can look at behavior-based decision models. These are things that I uh, shepherded and sort of managed a couple of research groups in Germany when I was doing the program. And lastly, we can plan for uncertain futures. These are exercises my students did about creating very, very adaptive futures that would go into the future. And then there's the whole issue of creating credible transparency. Uh, I think I'm a little bit over time, but Anub, if you don't mind, I'll take another few minutes here and then I'll wind up. Um, keeping innovation pragmatic. Now, most of us try to be creative inside an existing paradigm, right? And to a large extent, we kind of do okay. But if we want something radical, then we have to do something that says, let's do something really in future oriented. But if it's too far away from the paradigm, it's very hard to adapt. So if we sort of say, I want something that's outside the paradigm, but not crazy enough to be, I don't, nobody knows what to do with it. You have a better chance of pulling the paradigm along with you. We need tighter collaborations between the market, the government, philanthropies, and NGOs. And I'll just say again that the intersection space between them is really small. So, and we have to move upon beyond appeasement. So I want to end with the last three sort of elements, and we have to go beyond the traditional approaches. This is a picture I took of two very cute girls who were basically carrying water when they really shouldn't, they should be in school. They really shouldn't be carrying water at all. Um, and that this is basically saying we have to make adaptive decisions and not put our head in the sand. We do this individually, but unfortunately, we do it in groups. Okay. Now, the last three slides here are my recommendations to you. Four slides, really, maybe. One is develop strategies that consolidate and reinforce your urban assets. So the three things which I'll come back and end with are preserve, enhance, and create. Ask yourselves what is worth preserving, what is worth enhancing, and what is worth creating. The other is to manage crises. Develop preemptive and resilient urban design approaches to compensate for known and unknown man-made environmental crises. And this is because many cities will continue to just struggle to keep up. And that the goal is to say, if some part of my city stops working, can I design or plan the city so that the remaining parts can keep working and they can provide help and assistance to the parts that need it? And the third one here is social and cultural infrastructure. This is about integrating social and cultural infrastructure early in the planning and design of physical urban environments. And this is because social institutions take time to mature. Their physical and urban manifestations are sensitive. They are hard to create and easy to destroy. Those are the basic points. So I'll end with this particular notion that you really have to preserve your urban essentials. You have to ask yourself what is worth reinforcing and enhancing. And the third is let's think more carefully about what we want to create. You can see this diagram of the planner is pointing one way and the entire population is moving the other way. And the only way we can overcome this is to be brave.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Agit Garun Jain, for your presentation. Now we shall take a short break for our sponsor video. While renovating my house, I realized that furniture fittings are more important than furniture aesthetics. That's why I trust EPCO for all furniture hardware. EPCO simplifying lives. Go. Simplifying life.